Well, I, I looked at some of the interviews of you online, and I'm going to try very hard not to double up on questions, because <laughs> it sounds like you get asked the same things over and over and over. That's okay. Um, well, just to get started, um, you know, the, um, the participatory medicine and the e-patient um, movement is just really getting a lot of, uh, it's moving and it's accelerating really quickly. How do you see social media First half of the question, I guess, is adding to that and, you know, um, empowering that movement more. And then also on the flip side of that, kind of, I wonder if it's adding to the fears that doctors have around participatory medicine when you put that social media piece in there with it. Uh, let's see. The, so the first part of the question, um, how's it going to add to what they're doing? Um, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, things like... Um, uh, patient support groups, you know, have been um, around mm-hmm. for a very long time, um, and it's been interesting to see how the addition of social media has has added to that. Meaning that they're getting more people connected, um, especially internationally, and to mm-hmm. learn about how people in different countries with different healthcare systems um, deal with the same disease state. Um, okay. and that's been interesting to, for me to kind of see, I, I, um, I don't participate in that meeting that I don't, you know, post a lot of stuff. My main thing for that is I, I do a lot of listening, uh, because mm-hmm. you know, so, some of those disease states are not very common to my area, uh, where I practice, but I can at least draw some lessons from that. And I mm-hmm. think, you know, as, as time goes on and as new social media platforms come along, um, I think that's going to add and add more momentum to the uh, uh, e-patient uh, movement. Okay. All right. And then the flip side of that is I know that there are doctors that are wary of the e-patient movement um, and, uh, you know, have some concerns about it. And then I'm, I'm, I would guess that social media would just kind of add to another level of that. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think you know, what, what the e-patient movement uh, is doing is very good. Um, but, um, it's important to remember that, that, um, you know, all patients are not like that. Um, you know, I have a lot of my patients who, you know, like the more traditional, um, type of relationship with their physician. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, um, I think that also has value. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of physicians, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're afraid of it because they don't understand it. Um, mm-hmm. and I think, I think it's up to people like me to try to educate them and say, Hey, there is value to this. Of course, there are a lot of concerns when it comes to patient privacy and liability, but there's a lot of positive things that come from it too, especially when it comes to patient education. Um, and from a per business standpoint, you know, I tell physicians, this is a great, uh, uh, marketing platform. It's a free platform. Um, it's a way for physicians to get noticed out there, to become opinion leaders at the local level and which can um, expand, you know, to, you know, the entire world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, and then I guess kind of to piggyback off of that, and this, I'll be honest, this is a selfish question. Uh, I'm a new mom, and I'm pretty sure that makes me, you know, I've gotten more conflicting medical advice in the last eight months of my life than I have ever before. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, there's a lot out there. And for patients who are, you know, trying to empower themselves, trying to take control of their own health care, what tips will you give them about, you know, the credibility of the sources and where you're looking online and who to trust and who not to trust? Yeah, I, I get that question a lot. It's in, and a lot of people have told me, you know, uh, you know they say, hey, is, is there like a, uh, you know, seal of approval? Um, is there mm-hmm. something that I can look on in a website to say this is valued information? Uh, mm-hmm. But I think this is a, a great opportunity for for uh, for patients to dialogue with their physicians, and that, that's one of the reasons why I I tell physicians they have, they have to know about this stuff because our patients are going to push us to know about this every day in my office. I have people that bring in information from WebMD or another type mm-hmm. of website, and they ask me. They open the dialogue and say, "Is this reliable information?" Um, mm-hmm. You know. Because if you if you Google something like vaccines and autism, what are you going to get? You're going to get a lot of right. anti-vaccine you know type of rhetoric out there. Um, right. And from a physician standpoint, um, you know, I think it's important for us to post and to participate in uh, social media to get the right information out there. Um, so so I, I I think you know 
patients bringing this into me, I think that's the best thing uh, that they can do. The things I worry about are, are the people that, that don't see me or the people that they, you know, that, that they take that information on the internet, you know, as the truth. And sometimes it's not. And, and that's what I get concerned about. Okay. Um, any, any, I mean, you gave the example of, you know, obviously the vaccination autism one is a huge one out there right now. Um, are there any others that are just kind of big right now that you'd like to see squelch that you'd like to see? Okay. This, <laughs> this uh, kind of, well, I mean, yeah, I, I'm a primary care physician, you know, and you're a mom, you know, and, and, you know, the, there's, there's always, you know, the, the, uh, the information about, you know, things like, you know, primary care issues like, you know, you know, should you get an antibiotic? Should your child get an antibiotic? Um, right. you know, those type of things, you know, do flu shots cause the flu? They don't. Uh, but there's a lot of websites out there that says they are, or even the whole idea of immunizations in general, you know, are they right. safe? Are they dangerous? Um, mm -hmm. So those are the things that I encourage, especially primary care physicians. When it comes to other types of physicians, um, you know, specialists and things, they like to talk about, you know, uh, their procedures, you know, why they think that their procedures are, are the best, or they have quality data and saying, you know, we, you know, um, if you get them to the hospital in X amount of time, you know, we'll be able to save your heart muscle, or we'll be able to right. um, help, you know, uh, with your diagnosis of stroke and the appropriate treatment. Um, right. And, and th those are things that, that I tell physicians as far as those are types of things that, that they can utilize social media um, to help get their message out there. Okay. All right. Um, kind of moving on to another topic. How much have you seen social media being used as a tool in the whole healthcare reform issues that are all over right now? Oh, I mean, that's great. I mean, I, I, I write a lot about advocacy um, on my website. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had a huge uh, post last month um, whenever the last impending Medicare cuts uh, we're going to be happening uh, because definitely impact, impacts, you know, people like primary care, care physicians like me. Um, and I think especially going into this presidential election cycle, I think it's going to be very important, you know, for, for health care in general or especially for physicians, for patient advocates to get out there and, and to use social media to get their message out because we know that you know, the people that are against medicine or, or against business or against whatever um, – uh, you know, special interest group are out there, they're going to be using social media. So I, I think physicians should be advocates for our patients, and we should also be advocates uh, for ourselves as well. Okay. All right. Um, for your, uh, again, obviously one of the great big fears, as you said before, about social media physicians is, you know, HIPAA compliance and patient um, uh, privacy and stuff. Do you have, you know, some rules of thumb that you follow or your clinic follows as far as Facebook and tweeting that are just kind of like, this is what I don't do to keep myself safe? Uh, yeah, so um, I get that question a lot. And uh, I mm -hmm. was interviewed probably about a year ago um, by Medical Economics um, asking the question, do I friend my patients on Facebook, which is a huge discussion in the physician right. community right now. Right. Um, and what I tell people for me um, is that I, I usually friend my patients that I've known for a long time, not typically a new patient that I would see. Um, okay. And the other thing I tell people is, you know, I do not conduct any kind of patient care on the Internet or on no social media at all. Um, so when people contact me through Twitter or through Facebook regarding patient care issues, you know, if they are my patients, I tell them, you know, um, why don't you use the more traditional type of communication, you know, like calling the office, you know, using those type of things to come in and talk about it. I use the analogy of, you know, I live in a small town here in northeastern Ohio. And, you know, if I'm out at the grocery store, I'm out, I'm out at Walmart, you know, people approach me and ask me medical questions. I tell them the same thing. I'm like, you know, you know, I don't have my prescription pad today. You know, I would love to take right. care of you on Monday. You know, once you call the office and then, you know, I can, you know, do the appropriate exam and we can talk about things, you know, in a more private setting. So I, 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 I kind of use a similar type of model um, on the Internet as I do in real life. Okay. Okay. Any other kind of rules? And I'm not sure uh, um, who runs the. I know you really advocate having a clinic Facebook page. Um, do you have rules for whoever runs your, you know, Facebook page of your clinic that they need to follow? Um, yeah, I. Uh, you know, they have to check it every day. 
um, mm-hmm. because you never know who's going to be on it and who's going to be posting. Um, when mm-hmm. I tell docs, because they, you know, when I talk to them about, it, they're like, you know, they say, Mike, I have no time for this. You know, how can I fit this all in? Um, and I tell them, you know, it, if you find somebody in your hospital that does media or social media, you know, you don't mm-hmm. have to do it all yourself. Um, right. if, if there are, you know, patient um, specific questions on there, you know, I would direct them, you know, towards, you know, calling the office or, you know, get, you know, it, it, taking that offline um, right. and, and, and approaching that, especially if it's an angry patient or if there's a question sure. about something, um, to take that off the public forum and, and to use that. Um, other things I, I, I tell physicians, um, you know, I, I used to blog anonymously, um, and that's a whole different story, but I tell them, you know, you have to use your real name now. It's different times. Um, so use your real name out there when you identify yourself as a physician. Um, don't do patient care, you know, on the Internet. Um, those are some general guidelines that, that I tell physicians. Okay. Okay. Um, so we, uh, we have a free doctor review tracking tool on our website that we use to kind of help doctors manage um, the patient reviews that are just floating out there. Yeah, I, actually, uh, I think Mark sent me some emails and, and some, some Twitters, and uh, he, he, we've been kind of going back and forth. So I, I, I've checked out the product. It looks kind of interesting to me. Sure. Well, and I was just kind of wondering if you've used anything like that or how you kind of keep keep a handle on your online reputation because it is, I mean, there's, you know, tons and tons of sites out there and to keep up with all of it. I'm sure, you know, we've talked to doctors that are just like, it's just too much. I'm just kind of going to bury my head in the sand because I can't exactly. handle it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, I mean, I, what I do and, you know, because I have a very busy schedule, but for, for docs who are starting out or, or just kind of want to um, see what's out there, I just, just have them Google their name um, and then mm-hmm. kind of see what they get. And then and then at that point, start talking to them about services out there that are more extensive, that, that are very granular, uh, that can really drill down some things if they want that type of information. But you're right, it is very, very overwhelming. Sure, sure. All right. Um, so you've been blogging since 2006, is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. That's, that is a very long time. Um, <laughs> a lot of the doctors we talk to who are thinking about starting a blog are really concerned about running out of content. Yes. Like, how am I going to come up with something? Yes. Any advice on that or any great areas of inspiration for you? Um, well, especially, you know, I, I mean, it, it depends. You know, it, are, if they're seeing patients every day, um, usually there are seasonal things um, that come up. Um, mm-hmm. that can, you know, like usually in the summer or in the fall, there's flu shots or that type of thing. Or if there's quite, sometimes mm-hmm. the patient encounter can, can trigger a, uh, you know, a content, um, or something sure. in, the, in the, something in the community. Like if there's an outbreak of meningitis in the high school or something like that, that can, right. um, so, so really kind of, uh, keeping a pulse on the community as far as hot topics. Um, but they you know, all, there's always things that happen nationally, um, to have commentary on also, whether it is uh, health policy things or um, clinical things. You know, if there's a recall of, you know, a food or spinach or something, that they can use that as content as well. Okay. Um, now, how do you, you know, kind of back to that safety question, when you do have a patient interaction that kind of triggers you to block, I'm assuming you got to have some safety, safety nets in that as well. Oh yeah, I uh, you know I I don't mention the patient. I mean, I just I just I usually just mention the content. You know what it is. Um, okay. You know antibiotics or flu shots or something like that. I mean, and right. sometimes I would say, oh well, this you know this interaction triggers something uh, for me today, but usually not. I usually just kind of stick to what the direct content is. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, and have you ever, when you were kind of getting started, did you ever use a social media advisor or did you just kind of go for it on your own? Uh, no, I just asked questions of people who are out there already. Uh, you know, people like Kevin MD, who's been blogging since 2004. He's probably one of the earliest sure. people out there. Um, right. And the, the, especially the physician social media community is very friendly, very approachable. Um, and I just, you know, I threw them all my dumb questions and, uh, you know, mm. that happens to me now. I get, I get Twitter questions and, um, email questions to say, Hey, you know, what do you think about this? Uh, mm-hmm. so I, I think it's a, I, it's a very cool pair it forward thing, um, in the, in the physician social media community. Okay. Okay. And then, you know, my last question, I, I'm going to kind of back up a little bit to the, um, 
hesitant um, in, with some doctors with the social media and stuff. How much do you see that as being a generational thing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, especially in the past probably four or five years when um, the electronic medical record, the electronic health record has really been pushed upon us by the federal government. Um, there's been a lot of pushback um, from the older generation um, saying, oh, that social media is part of the computers. I hate computers. I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> uh, and, it, sure. and, it, and it's real. Uh, and, and I think it's really yeah. out there. Um, so yeah, I think I think part of it is, is generational. Um, but I still think a lot of it has to do with fear of being sued, liability, patient privacy. Um, and I think mm. those are still kind of the major issues. On the other side of that, I have a lot of um, docs um, – who want to use it, um, but there's no payment model for it. They want to email their patients. They want to um, you know, use electronic communication, um, but they're not being paid for it. So it's hard for them to really um, uh, uh, say, hey, I, I really want to do this. I know there's a lot of pilot studies that are going on, um, research that's going on right now, but but until there's some kind of payment model out there, it, that's going to be another hurdle in addition to privacy and, and liability and fear of being sued. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, and just, I just want to throw this out there to you. Is there anything else, any big hot topics that you don't get asked about that you think are important as this, you know, medical social media beast grows? Um, when when uh, I, I get um, asked about time, uh, especially for physicians who are very busy. Uh, right, say, right. You know, how am I going to squeeze all this in uh, when mm-hmm. I have, you know, all this in my EMR and all that kind of stuff? Um, mm-hmm. I tell physicians... Um, yeah, you know, the common misconception is that, you know, you have to post something, you have to create content. Um, when I tell physicians, when you start out, the best thing you can do is just like in a patient encounter is just listen, listen, what's mm-hmm. out there. Um, most docs are on Facebook because of their family. Um, you know, mm-hmm. s- subscribe to New York times, subscribe to, um, JAMA, um, you know, using Facebook, they, Docs don't know they could do that, and they can consume mm-hmm. their content that way. Um, and I think a lot of it, that's the start of it is just to say, "Oh, I didn't know I could get this electronically." It's maybe it'll work better for my workflow to do this rather than reaching out and doing, you know, searching all these sites or or looking on these websites to to get my news and get my research and get my content. So mm-hmm. so it is a slow process. You know, I even tell docs even just five minutes a day or five minutes twice a week starting out just to kind of get familiar with it. Um, and it's not all or nothing, um, just a little right. a little bit at a time. You'll get comfortable with it, um, and hopefully you'll eventually like it. <laughs> 